This is the sixth and concluding video on how to enhance your learning. In this video, I will talk about self-control and grit, meditation, and nutrition. Mark Twain said, Never put off till tomorrow what you can do the day after tomorrow. We've probably all been guilty of that when it comes to studying. Procrastination can take us from how we know we should be studying with spaced learning to block learning, such as pulling an all-nighter to cram for a test. So it's not surprising that procrastinators receive lower grades, but they also exhibit worse health, probably due to the fact they're under higher stress. There's a famous experiment that was performed in 1970 at Stanford and is referred to as the marshmallow test. Preschoolers were brought into a room and sat at a table with a marshmallow on it. The children were told they could eat the marshmallow at any time, but if they waited 15 minutes, they would get two marshmallows. The researchers then left the room. The purpose of this initial experiment was to observe what the children would do to wait 15 minutes. Some children sat on their hands, some covered their eyes, some looked all around the room except at the marshmallow. Of course, not all the children waited 15 minutes. Some even ate the marshmallow before the researcher was done explaining the rules. Many years later, the researcher followed up on the children and found unexpected correlations. The longer the delay of gratification, the more successful was the child. For instance, higher SAT scores. Of course, the sample size was small, and the participants came from Stanford's on-campus nursery school, so many of the kids were children of Stanford students or professors. But it is not a surprise that if you can resist temptations, such as watching TV, texting, going out with your friends to study instead, the more successful you will be in school. Angela Duckworth, a psychology professor at the University of Pennsylvania, talks about grit and the role it plays in success. Grit is the tendency to sustain interest in and effort toward very long-term goals. So grit is passion and perseverance for long-term goals. The more grit you have, the more effort you'll put into something. So here is Professor Duckworth's grit math. To develop a skill, it takes talent and effort. The less talent you have, the more effort it takes to get to the same level of skill. Once you have a skill, with effort then you can have achievements. So effort gets squared in going from talent to an achievement. So effort is a much more important factor in the equation to get to an achievement. The marshmallow test is an indication of self-control. Self-control is the ability to resist hourly temptations, the momentary pleasures that are immediately regretted. Grit is that ability to pursue something challenging for months, years, and sometimes even decades. Both attributes, self-control and grit, are important to success. Let's look at an example from a study by Anders Ericsson and his colleagues. If you recall, in part three, we looked at Anders Ericsson's work on the role of deliberate practice in becoming an expert. In this study, Ericsson had faculty at the Berlin University of the Arts identify violin students that had potential to become international soloists, those that had potential to be good members of an orchestra, and those who would probably end up being music teachers. He then looked at the accumulated practice hours versus age for the students in each of the three groups. 
At any age, he found that those who had potential to be international soloists had put in more practice hours than those who showed potential just to be members of an orchestra. And those who had potential to be members of an orchestra had put in more practice hours than those who would probably end up just being music teachers. He also had data for accumulated practice hours for professional violinists, which were very close to the students identified as having potential to be international soloists. The data shows for these students, the differentiator was not talent, but the number of hours of deliberate practice. To put in more hours of practice requires more self-control and more grit. Another observation was that students in the potential to be international soloist group slept more, including naps, than the students in the group with potential to be members of an orchestra. And the students who had a potential to be in an orchestra slept more than the students who would probably only teach violin. This reminds us of what we talked about in part four of the importance of sleep on learning. It makes sense that people with a growth mindset are grittier and more optimistic because they believe with effort they will get better. Babcock and Marx did a study and they found that in 1961, students spent 24 hours a week studying outside of class. By 2003, the number of hours spent studying outside of class had reduced to 14 hours. Does that mean we're becoming less gritty? Working hard can be learned. Culture can instill it. You need to be around gritty people. Find some gritty people in your class and become friends. Thinking of yourself as gritty can lead to being gritty. Angela Duckworth has found that students who participate for at least two years in the same extracurricular activity like chess club, the debate team, or sports are gritty. Remember Steve Falloon from Part 3 of Memorizing Digits fame? He was a serious runner and obviously gritty. There are many research studies showing that kids who are more involved in extracurriculars fare better on just about every conceivable metric. They earn better grades, have higher self-esteem, are less likely to get in trouble, and so forth. After controlling for high school grades and SAT scores, Participating in high school extracurriculars predicted graduating from college with academic honors better than any other variable. Let's look at a study of students studying. 263 students were told to study something important for just 15 minutes. The researchers noted what they were doing once a minute. On-task behavior began to decline at the two-minute mark. Over the 15 minutes, students spent only 65% of the time actually studying. The rest of the time was spent doing things like texting or checking social media. Another study found that texting and using Facebook in class and while doing homework were negatively correlated with college students' GPAs. So maybe the new marshmallow test of self-discipline is the ability to resist a blinking inbox or a buzzing phone. If someone is successful, it is mostly due to a gift of hard work and deliberate practice, not a gift of talent. How can you stop procrastinating and develop perseverance. You could try the Pomodoro time management technique. You decide on the task to be done. This can be homework, studying for an exam, writing a paper, or computer program. 
you make sure you put your phone away and detach from any social media. Then you set a timer for a short period of time. Traditionally, it is about 25 minutes. The reason this is called the Pomodoro technique is that Francis Cirillo, who developed this technique, had a kitchen timer in the shape of a tomato, and tomato in Italian is Pomodoro. You're now going to work on that task for 25 minutes. If you catch yourself being distracted, that's okay. Just turn your attention back to your work. Try to be mindful on your work for 25 minutes. When the timer goes off, take a break. It's important to take a short break, maybe three to five minutes. You could walk around. You can check your text messages. You could go get a drink of water or cup of coffee. This break will actually let some diffuse mode thinking occur. After you have done several of these 25-minute study segments, give yourself a longer break. Another way to increase your amount of willpower is mindfulness meditation. You can think of it as strength training for your brain. There are many types, but let me give you just one example. Find a comfortable chair in a quiet location. Close your eyes. Take slow, deep abdominal breaths. So your chest should not move, but your abdomen should rise and fall as you breathe. Now just concentrate on your breath. If you haven't meditated before, after a couple of breaths, you will find your mind has wandered to thinking of something else. That is okay. Once you sense your mind has wandered, bring it back to the breath. Try to work up to doing this meditation exercise for 10 minutes. Doing this meditation will result in stress relief, heightened awareness, it will enhance your concentration, and you'll be able to better ignore the mental chatter that distracts you. So what's happening while your meditation is you're paying attention to the present moment by concentrating just on your breath. Then you become distracted. Your mind starts to think of something else. You notice your mind has wandered, so you decide to refocus it and bring it back to the present moment, back to concentrating on your breath. At the different points in the cycle, Brain scanning with MRI shows different parts of the brain are active. Meditation will actually physically change your brain. A Harvard study looked at 16 healthy adults who had never meditated. These subjects had weekly classes on meditation, and they averaged about three hours per week meditating for eight weeks. MRI scans were taken before they started the program and after. The MRI scans indicated an increase in gray matter around the hippocampus. Remember, the hippocampus facilitates the formation of long-term memories. The MRI scans also indicated a decrease in gray matter around the amygdala. The amygdala is involved in emotional responses, especially fear and aggressive behavior. The decrease in the gray matter around the amygdala is probably why people who meditate appear to be calmer. Three hours per week meditating is a lot, but it only took eight weeks to see structural changes in the brain with MRI scans. There was a study at UCLA of people who had been meditating for a long time, uh, years and, and decades. And again, with MRI scanning, they observed that brains of people who meditated for a long time compared to people who have not thickens the brain and strengthens the connections between the brain cells. It 
also slow the age-related loss of gray matter, and there were a larger amount of gerification, that is, folding of the cortex, which may allow the brain to process information faster. A study conducted by the University of Pennsylvania Medical Center found that experienced meditators had significantly higher blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, parietal cortex, and other areas of the brain that support attention, regulation of emotion, and autonomic function. As you work to eliminate procrastination, don't get discouraged. It can take three months to establish a new set of study habits. Try to meditate for 10 minutes every day. It's strength training for your brain to enhance your concentration. You need to focus on the process and not the product. That's where the Pomodoro technique is useful. You should write down a list of your study tasks for tomorrow. Commitment and consistency is a subconscious psychological drive, and then by making a list of your tasks for tomorrow, you're tapping into that psychological influence. A very good book that discusses commitment and consistency and many other subconscious psychological influences is Influence the Psychology of Persuasion by Robert Caldini. Athletes know their diet can affect their performance. Similarly, diet can affect mental capabilities. I am not going to talk about a particular diet. There are many diets, proponents of these diets, and a lot of controversy. You have the low-fat to low-carb diets, Mediterranean, Ornish, vegetarian, Paleolithic, and so forth. But there's a few things that are known to be foods to avoid and foods to consume. There are some foods known to cause inflammation all over the body, and inflammation is not a good thing. Inflammation kills nerve cells. There is nothing good about consuming sugar and high fructose corn syrup. Those are toxins. If you just eliminated those two items from your diet, there's a good chance you would never develop type 2 diabetes or any form of dementia. If you want to know more about the toxic nature of sugar and high fructose corn syrup, you can go to the University of California at San Francisco, one of the top five medical schools in the U.S. website. At this website, you can learn more about how excess sugar consumption was linked to deficiencies in memory and overall cognitive health. In addition, you can learn of other consequences, such as how too much fructose can damage your liver, just like too much alcohol. Other items to avoid are trans fats, vegetable and seed oils, refined carbohydrates, excessive alcohol, and processed meats. In other words, avoid processed foods. So what is a processed food? Any food that comes with a label. In processing, usually two things that are bad for your health are done. Dietary fiber is removed and sugar is added. In fact, 80% of the foods in the U.S. have had sugar added to them. Removing the fiber and adding sugars to foods prolongs the shelf life but negatively impacts your health. Let me just mention a few foods that are known to reduce inflammation. One is omega-3 fatty acids, which can be found in fish and grass-fed beef. Apples, beets, blueberries, pecans and pistachios, red grapes, leafy greens, eggs, and green tea. Let me mention some of the key points I've covered in these six videos. You want to space out your studying. If you have a test coming up in a week, you want to have seven short study sessions, one every day, rather than using 
the full day before the test to study. You want to interleave topics and subjects. You want to study in different settings. You study to understand, not just trying to memorize a procedure or equation. Explaining things out loud to yourself helps you understand. You want to develop a growth mindset. You want to develop grit. You want to develop self-control. You may have a habit of procrastination. Grit and self-control is a new habit, and it takes a while to develop new habits. We talked about using the Pomodoro method and meditation to try to develop these new habits of grit and self-control. You want to take handwritten notes. You want to add that sense of touch and that processing that goes on when you take notes. You want to make a list of tasks for the next day. That will greatly increase the odds of you completing those tasks. Sleep is very important to the learning process. Exercise is very good for your brain. Healthy diet is also very good for your brain. So many of the things I talked about during these six videos can be found in one or more of these books that I have listed here on this page. In part two, we looked at three puzzles that require diffuse mode thinking to solve, and I said I would show you the solutions at the end of part six. The first one was this arrangement of dimes in an upward pointing triangle and you need to move three dimes to form a downward looking triangle. So the solution I came up with was take these three dimes and move them. Here we have a downward pointing triangle. When I looked at the solution in the book, the three dimes they moved were this one down to here, this one up to here, and this one up to here to form this downward pointing triangle. The second problem was to find the three errors in this sentence. Using focus mode thinking, you probably found the two spelling errors. You may have needed to use diffused mode thinking to find the third error, which was there are only two errors, so the statement is an error. And finally, you were to figure out how to draw four lines without raising your pencil that goes through all nine dots. So you probably needed to use diffuse mode thinking to think outside the nine dots.